It's no secret that the Russian invasion of Ukraine has not gone according to the Kremlin's plans. What looked like a landslide victory for the Russian military in the spring of 2022 has now become a meat grinder of a stalemate, reminiscent of the Western Front during World War I. While this war continues to rain down destruction on the local level, the war in Ukraine has far-reaching implications that go beyond Europe and onto the world stage as well. China has long been a partner of Russia, going as far back as the early days of the Cold War. Now China again finds itself embroiled together in another sort of proxy war with their old friend. China and Russia are inseparable, with many shared interests, resources, and possibly even destinies. If Russia's invasion of Ukraine were to flounder and go belly up, it would have several terrifying and dangerous implications for China. With Russia defeated, Putin overthrown, or a second Russian civil war kicking off, China's standing in the international community would be in jeopardy, and they would be left with an exposed flank. Let's dive in. Starting off with the most immediate consequence, the balance of world power. The fighting in Ukraine is, depending on who you get your news from, not going according to plan for the Kremlin. They assumed that they would roll over Ukraine in a matter of days, sweeping aside their small military and taking over key cities. That clearly did not happen. They forgot to take into account that the Ukrainian people are incredibly tough, resilient, and no strangers to foreign invaders. They'll defend their families and their homes to the last bullet. Another thing they did not count on is the good old American arms industry. American weapons and supplies, along with the rest of NATO, have kept the Ukrainian military as armed and as dangerous as possible. So yeah, it was a bit of a miscalculation. The Russian military has taken a few black eyes over the past two years and has barely completed any of the objectives it began with. Now let's just assume that the Ukrainians are able to achieve victory or, at the very least, mire the Russian military into a grinding slow defeat. If something like this were to happen, it would shake Russia to its very core. You can only deceive people for so long before they see the truth of the situation. Vladimir Putin has bet the farm on this war, used it for all of his propaganda for his alleged re-election, and convinced at least some of the Russian public that the war is crucial. Some Russian holy men even went as far as to call this a holy war. Long story short, Russia simply cannot afford to lose this war, and neither can China. So what happens to China if Russia loses and or collapses? From a strategic point of view, China would be very lonely on the world stage. The loss of Russia as a serious partner and deterrent to the West would shift the balance of power away from China. China would be left with Iran and North Korea as the top allies against the United States, Great Britain, and all of NATO. A situation like this is something that she is desperately trying to avoid. Chinese military planners have been studying the war in Ukraine as a classic example of what not to do and how to turn the entire world against you. It's almost certain that with the military failures we've seen in Ukraine, the Chinese military planners have gone back to the drawing board for their own plans. One of the main stressors is sure to be the scenario of what would happen if their arms trade with Russia was suddenly cut off. With how the Chinese handled the Tiananmen Square situation in 1989, China has been under an arms embargo and hasn't been able to buy or sell anything of military value to the West ever since. Consequently, China's relied heavily on Russia to procure arms and military supplies ever since, beginning with the acquisition of complete weapon systems and progressing to the building of an entire defense industry. China's also become a major military manufacturing hub for Russia. This newfound Chinese military industrial complex has only accelerated under President Xi, who stresses Chinese self-sufficiency and seems likely to continue down that path. Their partnership with Russia continues to get deeper and deeper, bleeding into all sectors of the economy. This relationship has continued, and some would say accelerated, since the war in Ukraine began, with China circumventing worldwide sanctions against Russia. While China is not outright admitted to giving military help to Russia, it's not a huge leap of the imagination. A crippled or destroyed Russia would prove disastrous for the Chinese military-industrial complex and would result in an unimaginable loss in revenue. China might be able to sell the arms to other smaller countries, but nothing can replace the black hole for weapons that is the Russian military in Ukraine. Outside of the defense industry, China is one of the largest energy importers and consumers. Although it produces a lot of energy, oil, and gas, it needs to import a large amount to keep up with the demand of its growing economy. It's also the world leader in the production of electric vehicles, which require a lot of resources. On top of all that, China is the world leader in coal production and a major consumer of it as well. Because of this, China is constantly the worst emitter of greenhouse gases around the world. China accounted for about a quarter of the world's consumption in 2022, 
it consistently ranks in the top three consumers of oil, gas, coal, nuclear, hydro, wind, and solar power. Its overall energy consumption rate has been steadily increasing over the past decade. Its consumption continues to outpace its production, and this has turned China into a major importer, importing around 85% of the energy it consumes from abroad. China's importation of Russian oil and gas has only increased since the beginning of the war in Ukraine. This is due in part to their increasingly close partnership, but also due to the war in Ukraine and the sanctions and embargoes that followed. With the completion of the Eastern Siberia Pacific Ocean Pipeline ESPO, in 2011, Russia has been able to efficiently get its oil to consumers in Asia, especially China. In 2022, Russian oil exports to China grew by 16%, and Russia became the largest oil supplier to China. In addition to this, China has become one of the largest recipients of Russian gas. Before 2019, Russia supplied 3% of China's gas. But ever since the completion of another pipeline, the Power of Siberia 1, Russia has become China's fourth largest supplier, growing to 8.5% of their imports. That number has grown even further since then, with some estimates saying that since 2022, Chinese imports of Russian gas have increased by 50%. A larger pipeline is currently being built, and when completed, it'll only increase the trading partnership between the two nations and help Russia make up the ground they lost when their gas exports were shut out of Europe. If Russia were to fall or become destabilized, this could drastically affect every facet of the Chinese economy and its military. While the Chinese government is careful not to overly rely on one supplier, the amount of Russian oil and gas they use cannot be ignored. If the worst were to happen, China would have to replace that oil and gas to maintain the pace of growth. As international tensions between China and the West continue to grow, they may have to get a little creative to meet their demand. They could increase their reliance on Venezuela or Qatar to fill the gap. But if the supply cannot meet the demand, then this could become a bit of a sticky situation rather quickly. A Russian decline would only strengthen the West and give them more confidence in their advantages over the Chinese. In the global power struggle between East and West, both sides are always looking for an edge, something to knock the opponent down a peg. China suddenly finds itself feeling very lonely, or at the very least unsupported on its side of the table, and the West might do something bold to shake things up economically as well. Besides the obvious sanctions and tariffs that could be imposed, China has much bigger fears about the survival of its latest project. The Belt and Road Initiative is a massive infrastructure undertaking, often referred to as the New Silk Road. If you remember from history class, the Silk Road was the first of its kind. A series of trade networks connected East and West in a dazzling display of wealth and international cooperation. Cultures and religions mixed like never before, planting the seeds of globalization. For all their bloodlust and shocking levels of violence, the Mongols actually saw the value in the Silk Road and kept it going. President Xi Jinping launched the Belt and Road Initiative in 2013 to increase Chinese influence around the world. The project seeks to link Asia with Africa, Oceania, Latin America, and Europe through a series of development and investment opportunities. I know what you're thinking. Is this just a way for China to expand its military around the globe? Maybe, and you aren't alone in thinking that. Many world leaders, including President Biden, are very skeptical of the true nature of this initiative. The initiative will create new railways, energy pipelines, highways, and border crossings. The goal is to connect former Soviet republics like Kazakhstan and Tajikistan with Pakistan, India, and Southeast Asia. The overland connection would flood Asia with more Chinese currency than ever and boost economies across the continent. In addition to this, China has funded hundreds of economic zones and industrial areas in their own country that are supposed to create jobs and stimulate growth. The second part of this plan involves maritime trade and could see investment worldwide. China has agreed to invest in port development along the Indian Ocean, all over Southeast Asia, East Africa, and parts of Europe. The reach of the project is impressive. So far, 147 countries have agreed to be a part of the initiative or are interested. Those countries cover about two-thirds of the world's population and 40% of the global GDP. China has already contributed a staggering amount of money to the project, totaling around $1 trillion. The total expenses are projected to be around $8 trillion. The largest section of the initiative so far is the China-Pakistan Corridor, or CPEC, which has cost around $62 billion. The goal of CPEC is to connect China to Pakistan's Gwadar port on the Arabian Sea. Ambitious doesn't even come close to covering the immensity of this whole thing. China desperately wants to grow its economic influence worldwide, develop new trade routes, 
grow its export markets and boost Chinese incomes. While China's motivations seem clear on the surface, many are wary of their true intentions. One of the key issues Western countries have with this initiative is that the Chinese can exert geopolitical influence on those smaller countries or bind them into contracts that solely benefit the Chinese. In some cases, China retains the right to demand loan repayment any time. This gives China the ability to strong-arm smaller countries into being on the Chinese side of things on issues such as Taiwan or their treatment of the Uyghurs. For this project and the interests of the Chinese abroad, they need the scales of power to stay where they are. They have far too much to lose. Time will tell how this incredibly ambitious project pans out. But another major source of fear for the Chinese is the backlash they might receive when it comes to the Uyghurs or Taiwan. If there suddenly was a massive shift in global power to the West, the CCP would be in trouble for the way it's treated the Uyghurs. The Uyghurs are a Muslim minority ethnic group that lives primarily in northwestern China. In recent years, the CCP has come under tremendous scrutiny for its alleged persecution of this group. Beginning in 2014, the CCP and President Xi authorized the incarceration of around 1 million Uyghurs in internment camps. This was done with no legal process, and it is the largest scale detention of a minority group since the Second World War. Take a second to think about that one. Once in these camps, the Uyghurs were subjected to forced labor, suppression of their religion, political brainwashing, forced sterilization, and even forced abortions. Many of their mosques were destroyed, and hundreds of thousands of children were taken away from their parents and shipped to boarding schools where even more horrors awaited them. By 2019, the camps had started to be phased out, and the Uyghurs were sent to more traditional penitentiaries. But who knows if their living conditions improved? The whole situation is deplorable and a clear violation of every basic human right. China does not want more attention on this or any Western interference that could occur if China suddenly found itself on its back foot. The same goes for Taiwan. Unless you've been hiding under a rock since the late 1940s, you should know that China is very eager to bring Taiwan back into the fold. China wants to take it back with as little fuss as possible, but unfortunately for them, Taiwan doesn't want that, and they have a lot of firepower backing them up. Seeing the Russian invasion of Ukraine flounder the way it has surely has pushed back any Chinese plans to take Taiwan by force. Now on paper, the People's Liberation Army, or the PLA, is just as impressive and well-armed as its Russian counterpart. It has state-of-the-art weapon systems and enough manpower to intimidate anyone. Will it all come together and push through to victory? It's hard to say. The PLA has not been involved in a serious war since 1979. They participated in a UN peacekeeping mission in Africa in 2016, but very few PLA soldiers were involved in that. I'm sure the PLA would love to forget about it too, as it was a disaster for them. Any officers with actual combat experience are well into their 50s, if not their 60s. The PLA's lack of hands-on field experience is a major cause for concern. That would be like getting ready for a football game, but only one guy has actually played against an actual opponent. In addition to their lack of experience, they also have not tested their weapon systems in real combat, at least not to any serious degree. I'm sure they've passed every benchmark on the range, but that can only get you so far. Look at their main assault rifle, the QBZ-95. It's great on the range, but will it deliver on the battlefield? There might be a bit of a learning curve once the bullets start flying. Even from a tactical level, the invasion plans might require some rethinking. Amphibious invasions, which are the most likely course for the PLA to take, are challenging. Weather and surprise play large factors in the success of those operations, and both seem unlikely to favor the PLA. The Taiwanese defense is outfitted with state-of-the-art radar systems, as well as some assistance from the US government's satellites and drones. If everything is operational, they'll see any invasion coming from a long way off. The only real chance the PLA has here is a coordinated strike with cyber attacks that blind Taiwan and the US radar and reconnaissance devices. As if that wasn't enough, the weather in the Taiwan Strait can be unpredictable and volatile at times. The area can experience typhoons, dense fog, high winds, tropical storms, waves up to 20 feet high, and even two different monsoon seasons. An amphibious invasion is a logistical nightmare all on its own, even before you add in inclement weather. If PLA troops were able to make it ashore, they would face a fortress of defensive works. The Taiwanese have spent the last few decades rearming and preparing to defend their island against what seems like an inevitable invasion. They built defensive fortifications and tunnels into the rugged topography of the island to move troops and supplies to various positions without exposing them to enemy fire. 
In addition to this, the Taiwanese soldiers are planning to use a strategy that's been leveling the playing field in Ukraine, that of asymmetrical weapon systems. Weapons like the Javelin or Stinger missile systems can be extremely effective and can level the playing field for smaller armies facing much larger ones. These portable weapons can maximize your advantages, like stealth and speed, while minimizing the enemy's armor and numerical advantage. So even if the invading forces are able to put boots on the ground, they'll face a tremendous challenge once they begin inland. They'll face a determined enemy with well-supplied, well-prepared defenses who have been waiting for this day for a very long time. Another major roadblock to Chinese ambition is the United States' bases and forces, which are always within striking distance of Taiwan. The United States military has several bases around Taiwan in countries such as the Philippines and Japan. In 2014, the U.S. signed the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement EDCA, with the Philippine government, which allowed the U.S. to build nine military bases, rotate troops through the country, and train local forces. Japan has a similar agreement, and the U.S. has about 20 bases currently in the country. More recently, U.S. Special Forces units have been rotating through some of the small islands surrounding Taiwan. Much to Chinese annoyance, this move is seen as a further provocation of an already unfriendly situation. In addition to supplies and advice, the U.S. and Taiwan have defense agreements in place that would see the U.S. theoretically help defend the island. The wording of the agreement is somewhat vague, but it's clear enough that the Chinese will get the picture. Attack Taiwan and the situation becomes an international crisis between two nuclear superpowers very quickly. The situation is fragile, to say the least. The high-level planners in the PLA and the CCP are very cautious about how to proceed. They've seen the Russian invasion of Ukraine and are trying to learn from their mistakes. They don't want to overextend themselves and get drawn into a war of attrition like the Russians have. A prolonged conflict is exactly what the CCP wants to avoid. Covid was a trying time for China. Its people were oppressed, their freedom and civil liberties were systematically stripped from them, and things became more and more like 1984 every day. Unrest and outbursts of protests were common during the height of the Covid-19 pandemic, and a potentially unpopular war was one thing the CCP did not want. It wouldn't be the first time a war took a turn for the worst and caused the citizens to rise up and overthrow the government. That possibility alone is giving the CCP pause as it considers the next steps when it comes to Taiwan. The last thing that she and the CCP want is to emerge weaker and more isolated from a botched invasion of Taiwan. Now you can guarantee that any invasion in the near future will be as well prepared as humanly possible to avoid a pitfall similar to Ukraine, but the outcome is far from certain. All in all, the war in Ukraine has rippled across the world and it's impacting the actions and policies of many countries. One of the countries that's watching the action the closest is China. They are deeply embedded with the Russians both militarily and economically. Their trading of arms and energy is critical to the growth and future of both nations. The last thing China wants is for there to be a shift in global power that leaves the United States and the West in a position to go after China. On the surface, the war in Ukraine looks like it's a fight between Ukraine and Russia. But in reality, it's the pinnacle of a global power struggle that threatens to derail the fate of many nations. Time will tell. Now check out analyzing Russia's massive failures in war against Ukraine, or watch this video instead.